My name is Alana. I am a survivor of domestic abuse. Today, I am breaking my silence. Tell me about the reproductive coercion that you were subjected to. So, when I was with my abuser, there was a number of times that I had suffered sexual assault. I would wake up in the middle of the night and he would be touching me. I, I thought it was normal. I thought that that's what happens in a relationship. You know, that's... I was his property. He could do what he wanted. And if he didn't get what he wanted, I, I, I would feel the repercussions of it. So after my first two children, I had fallen pregnant again. And he openly told me that he didn't want this child. He didn't want me, he didn't want the child. And if I was to have the child, I was on my own. At that time, I was so engrossed in his clutches, he had me. I knew that it had been drilled into my head for so long that I couldn't be on my own. I was a crap mum. I would never make it. I couldn't do anything. So he forced me to go for a termination. And it was hands down one of the hardest days of my life. I lost that baby on my birthday. And every year since, I've remembered it. That must have had like a massive impact. Huge, huge impact. And I think it's such a taboo subject that it's not, it's not spoken about enough. I didn't have a choice. I was made to believe that I, I wasn't a good mum. So how could I possibly have another child? It was completely taken away from you. Yeah. It was horrible. Horrible. But I'm, I moved on and I had left him. I... <sighs> After I left him, I got on with my life. And then my gran died. My gran was always my rock. She raised me, she was my mum. She was my biggest supporter. And the first person I called was him because that was all I knew. So I went back to him again and I fell pregnant with my son. And he made it clear from the start all he ever wanted was a son. But it didn't take long after that for him to become very abusive again. And I think it's something that will live with me forever. The day I had my son, he spent 45 minutes with us and then he went and got drunk and I received abusive message after abusive message. How I wasn't good enough. Why did I have to always have a C-section? Why couldn't I just be a woman? Why couldn't I just give birth? So he'd already once forced his termination on you and now you had a son, which is yeah. what he always wanted. It was never going to be enough, was it? No, never was. I think I, looking back, hindsight's a great tool. And looking back, I could, I could see red flag after red flag after red flag. But it was so drilled into my head that I wasn't good enough. So who, who would want me? Who would want me with three children? You know? What did those red flags look like? The name calling. He had bought me a dog when I was pregnant with my first daughter. And he told me I can't leave the dog at home on its own. And I was too frightened to take the dog out. So he knew I would be home. He knew exactly when I would be home because I couldn't leave the dog. And I didn't take the dog out with me. So it wasn't really an overtly abusive tactic, right? Yeah. But it was a very smart one, wasn't it? It was very, very subtle. Very subtle. And I think, looking back, I can see what was happening. But whilst I was in the relationship, it was normal. He bought me a dog, it was lovely. But little did he tell everyone that he had pinned me up by my neck the week before that, or that I was called every name under the sun, and that I wasn't good enough. When my first daughter was a week and a half old, my C-section scar had come undone because he had grabbed the pushchair so forcefully from me in order to take her. I grabbed it back and my C-section scar came open. So what did parenting look like then with a the newborn whilst being subjected to all this abuse? Oh, it was hard. It was, it was incredibly hard because I think as a parent, 
your first instinct is to protect your child. And I knew, deep down, I knew he would never hurt her. He would never have hurt any of them. But he would say terrible, terrible things to my middle child. And I think part of that is because he saw her, me in her. She is me. With, with the same person. But that, it's affected our whole family. Our whole family, it affects the way that I parent my children. I overcompensate now. I give them everything, anything they ever wanted, because it was something that I wasn't allowed to do while I was with him. You, or you can't buy that for her. You can't buy that for him. Well, who told you to spend the money? It was constant, a barrage of abuse every single day for 11 years. So whilst he wasn't directly abusing the other two children, he was in other ways, really, because yeah. he was blocking you from buying things that they may have needed. Yeah. I remember specifically the last incident, the one where I said, enough is enough now. I am going and I am never coming back. My son was in another part of our house at the time. Myself and him had had an argument and I remember there being black bags on the floor. I think I was cleaning something up. I was doing something at the time. And he pushed me so forcefully that I fell into a cabinet. I cut all my elbow. My head whacked the, the windowsill. And as I was laying there, the only thing I could hear was my son shouting, Mummy, 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 Mummy. And he is the only reason I got back up that day. But as soon as I got up, I had to clean myself up. I had to go and pick my other children up from school. And I had to paint a smile on my face because it was the only thing that was getting me through the day. Well, you had to disassociate from what yeah. you were going through to survive. So mentally, I blocked off from that point. That was it. Slowly, I started going into court. Things were getting better. And I, I won every single case, every single case but it would never stop. He would still come round, banging on the windows, banging on the doors, screaming at the children to let him into the house. So tell me what your experience was like with agencies and services during the post-separation abuse. There isn't enough support. There definitely isn't. I went through my help in the pandemic. So there was no face-to-face, -face. there was no one coming to check you were okay. There was no one to call because they were all busy. Even after the pandemic had gone, even when I would call agencies, oh, well, there's a backlog, so we'll, we'll put you on a waiting list. But I needed the help there and then. I didn't need to go on a waiting list. Who did help in the end then? Who was there for you? So I reached out to a number of my friends. My best friend lived above me at the time and she could hear everything. She would constantly text me and say, are you all right? Like, are you sure you're all right? And one day I just let it all out. I let it all out. I started putting pa plans in place so that me and my children could move, we could be safe, we could be happy. I contacted a number of agencies to get support for myself so that I could believe I was the person I should have always been. I finished university, I graduated, I took my children on holiday, and slowly but surely, things started getting better because I believed in myself. So what I'm hearing is, actually it was the people around you that supported you, and not the services and organisations that should have Absolutely. supported you with their resources. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong, their resources helped, but having the little community that I had was the biggest help. My friends, my family, my children. And what's life like now? You mentioned you've, these achievements. Yeah. What's it like now? Look at the big smile. <laughs> it like now? now it's happy, it's happy. I've spent two and a half years healing my children from wounds I never created, but I've graduated, I've taken them on holiday, our first solo holiday. I've applied for my masters. I've found love. I've grown. When you put a seed in the right soil, it will flourish.
when you look back at who you were living with a perpetrator, do you think you could have ever imagined this life? Never, never. I look back sometimes and I, I don't recognise her. I see her pain, I see the fear in her eyes, but I don't recognise her. She's not me. I'm a completely different person. And I can't believe that one human was able to destroy another human so badly. Being in a new relationship after leaving a perpetrator is hard. I'm finding that out for myself, right? What was it like for you to navigate within that? Incredibly hard, incredibly hard. There would be nights I would shiver in bed because I was so frightened, not of my new partner, but of my past, of my story, of everything. Why should I live in fear? Why should I be scared? Why should my new partner have to mend a heart he didn't break? That's not fair. Have you experienced any other forms of post-traumatic stress or anxiety or depression since leaving? Definitely. When we moved to our new area, myself and the children, I was scared to walk down the street because I had been so used to being surrounded by his friends, his family, his lifestyle, that I thought the next corner I turn, there's gonna be someone he knows, that's it, the game is up, he's gonna know where I am, and it's gonna be worse than it ever was before. I think part of you, if you've lived in survival mode, part of you is so used to surviving that you convince yourself that there's no one around that corner. There's no one there, it's in your head. How do you feel now living outside of survival mode? Or do you feel like you are outside of survival mode? Oh, I'm free. I'm, I'm definitely free. I'm gone. He has no clutches on me anymore. My life is completely different. I live in a house he has never stepped foot in. I have children he no longer knows. My life is different. I have ambitions. I'm, I'm free. <laughs> You're powerful. You reclaimed it all back for yourself and your children. I did, I did. And if there's one thing I will teach my daughters is that they are the most powerful beings in this world. They just have to find it within themselves.